Welcome to Math 331, Problem Solving. This is Lecture 32. So what we're going to do today is we're going to fix the problem from last time. And so there was you know, some very small mistakes that we made. Uh, and then after we fix the calculation, then we'll talk about handling the more general case. Because we started by looking at an isosceles right triangle. Is it sufficient to just understand that? So uh, the nice thing about having the slides available is I can quickly go through and see where was the mistake made. And so the mistake was that the low box is not y minus x by one minus y, it is y by one minus y. So when we look at the picture of the triangle we drew um, over here, this should not have been a y minus x. That should have been a y. And so that was the mistake. Should be y, not y minus x. And one way to see, and again, it, it's actually good sometimes to make mistakes like this, to see if this is reasonable, is we were getting that the answer was always one quarter as long as you moved halfway down. Well, we could just you know try drawing in you know other triangles. Um, you know, if we take the limit as the point goes to zero and then go halfway down, then we do get one quarter. But what if we did something else? What if we went down one third and then go down half? So one third plus one half is five sixths. And so if we do that, we would have something like this. And so this is one third, this distance is one half, this is one third, so the area of that rectangle is one sixth. Um, if this is five sixths, this is one sixth over here. So this is five thirty six for that area. And note, one sixth plus five thirty six equals eleven thirty six does not equal one fourth. So that's a clear proof that we made an algebraic mistake somewhere. So the method was fine, but we, there was a small algebra mistake, and the algebra mistake. Uh, has already been identified. So if we now draw the triangle properly, so now you know, we have this distance here is x, and then I'll draw it like this. This whole distance here is y, um, and this distance here is going to be 1 minus y. This distance here is going to be y. This distance here is going to be x. This distance here is going to be y minus x. So we would get that the area as a function of x and y is going to be x times y minus x plus y times 1 minus y, or xy minus x squared plus y minus y squared. So now if we start doing the calculations, we would get you know dA dx a so dA dy is going to be, so we get, uh, take the, we get x for the first term, the negative x squared gives us nothing, the plus y gives us one, the minus two y, the minus y squared gives us minus two y, so dA dy equals zero implies y equals x plus one over two. Is x plus one over two a good value for y? Does this pass the smell test? You can, but just looking at it, does this look reasonable? Two y equals x plus one. Like I mean, yeah, that's fine. What do you know about y from how we've drawn the picture? It's larger than x, so it passes, smell, passes the smell test. We know x is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 1. Note x plus 1 over 2 is going to be greater than or equal to x. So it's at least reasonable. So this is just fixing the algebra mistake from last time we had the long area for the triangle. And now when we do it, we now get that the area does depend on 
X, which makes sense, which is what we would expect. And again, one way we could see we had made an algebra mistake is just try drawing something other than um, X equals zero, and we would see that the area is not one quarter. Okay, so now let's take our function. We now know that the best value for this particular function, so it's largest when y equals x plus one over two. So I'm gonna define a new function area of x to be a of x, x plus one over two. A lot of times people do an abusive notation and instead of calling the new function area of x, they just call it a of x again and just over, override the notation. You've probably seen this in a lot of books where if you have a composition of functions, for instance, they'll use the same letter before and after the composition and can get really confusing. So I like to just introduce a new name. So area of x is then going to be um, x times x plus one over two. So it's going to be, let's, after what happened last time, let's do it slowly. Minus x plus one, I'm sorry, minus, sorry, minus x squared over two plus y is x plus one over two minus y squared is going to be x plus one squared over four. So area prime of x, because it's not just a function of one variable, is going to be, I right, the first term, this is one half x squared plus x over two. So area prime is going to be x plus one half minus x, I believe, plus one half minus one half x plus one. If I've done the algebra correctly. So area prime of x is going to be the x's cancel. The one half give us a one minus a half is. Oh, have I made an algebra mistake again? Let me just check and make sure we haven't made a mistake. It's x times x plus one over two minus x squared over two plus x plus one over two minus x plus one squared over four. x squared over two derivative becomes x. x halves, the derivative of that becomes one half minus x squared over two, the derivative of that becomes just minus x. Okay. Um, and then the derivative of x plus one over two becomes a one half. And then we have to subtract off. Two. All right, so I get one minus one half x minus a half. Is everybody getting this? I have a feeling I'm making an algebra mistake again. Because that gives me x equals one. So who can see the algebra mistake? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, here's the mistake. I'm, I'm running this as xy. It's supposed to be, this is not supposed to be y. It's what's y minus x. So y minus x is not x plus one over two. What should y minus x be? It should be one half, it should be one minus x over two. Right? Y minus x is equal to x plus one over two minus x is one minus x over two. So this shouldn't have been an x plus one over two, it should have been a one minus x. That's the mistake. 
Okay, at least we found it quickly this time. So this should be one minus X. And so when we expand it out, this becomes X halves minus X squared over two. Okay. And now when we do that, Okay, there we go. So now the x halves, its root of is one half, the negative x squared over two is going to give us a minus a half. A minus a half x, right? And then the next term is the minus x squared over two is going to give us a minus x. And then an x plus one over two is gonna give us a one half. So we would get one half uh, plus one half minus a half, putting all the constants together, minus one half x minus x minus one half x. So area prime of x is going to be one half should be minus three halves x. So did we uh, drop a sign somewhere? Oh no, I, I, I expanded things up by writing it as y x minus x squared, all right. Start all over, yep. When, when, when you make an algebra mistake, just start all over. So do we agree that this is the function? It becomes xy minus x squared plus y minus y squared. All right. And y equals x plus one over two. So let's let's just do it really slowly. Area of x is a of x, x plus one over two. That's gonna be x times x plus one over two minus x squared plus x plus one over two minus x plus one over two squared. All right, so please watch and see if you can find the algebra mistake so we don't keep doing this. All right, so the first one becomes x squared over two plus x halves minus x squared plus x halves plus one half minus, let's just expand the damn thing out, minus x squared plus two x plus one over four. So x squared minus, x squared over two minus x squared is gonna be a minus x squared over two. x halves plus x halves is plus x. We have a plus one half. We have a minus x squared over four. Then we have a plus, I'm oh, sorry, we have a, sorry, uh, a minus, x over two from the two x over four, and then a minus one quarter. All right, so x squared over two minus x squared over four is going to be minus three fourths x squared. Then we have an x minus an x halves is gonna be a minus x halves. No, a plus x halves, right? X minus x halves is plus x halves. Then we have a half minus a fourth is going to be plus a fourth. So area prime of x, finally, when the dust settles, is going to be minus three halves x plus one half. Good. So area prime of x equals zero implies three halves x equals one half or x equals one third as y equals x plus one over two, we get y is equal to one third plus one over two. That is four thirds over two, that's two thirds. I don't trust my algebra at this point. And so we do get the intuition that it was go down a third, go down a third. So 
go down one third, go down another one third. So we've now solved the problem for an isosceles right triangle. Yes. So then the question is, what if we don't have an isosceles right triangle? So again, there's probably more than one way to do this. Let's see what would happen if we stretch things out. So initially, this was one. Let's stretch it out to be R. And so to put in some coordinates, this would be the point zero, zero. This would be the point one, zero. This would be the point R, zero. And then up here, this would be the point zero, one. And so we had our initial rectangles like this. And now we're going to stretch them. So let's put in a related color to stretch them. So we need to figure out how the points get moved. Right? So the equation of the black line, that's going to be y minus one equals the slope, which is negative one times x minus zero, or y equals negative x plus one, or x equals one minus y. So are we good with the equation of the black line? Just point slope? Now let's do the equation of the blue line. Equation of the blue line y minus one. So what's the slope of the blue line? It goes from zero one to R zero. So the slope is just gonna be one minus zero over zero minus R, which is negative one over R, right? So it's just going to be, I'll just move this R up so it's not as confusing. So it's going to be negative one over R X minus zero or Y equals negative one over R X plus one or X equals um, So it would be one minus y times r. So I think r minus r y. Yep. So we now need to figure out you know what the points are. So for this point, if this is x, what's the corresponding height? So where would I be on the black line if I have a height of x? If I have, if I go over x units on the horizontal, how high up do I go? I'm sorry. No, I'm I'm going to the point of the black line. I'm at you know. It's x comma, what's the height? I'm sorry? Oh, wait. So x is x to the distance from the origin. So x to the distance from the origin, that's x. It's just one minus x. You know, I'm on the black line. The black line is the set of all points x plus y equals one. I could look at the equation uh, y equals negative x plus one. So when I look at that, if you know, I take x, then y has to be, okay. So now, how would I figure out what the coordinate is over here? 
well, I know the height. What's the height here? One minus X. So I now need to just figure out what is the X that corresponds to that. So which equation should I use? Well, I know what Y is. So I should use this one over here, right? And so using that, I would get um, X is equal to R minus R times one minus X. So that's just R minus R, and then the minus and minus becomes a plus Rx. So I use that in quotes. So it's just going to be R times X. So we see that what happens is the area of the box, if we stretch the base of the triangle by a factor of R, then we've stretched that box by a factor of R. Right? So if we look at what was going on in the black triangle land, we had, let's call this, you know, one, let's call this two, and then we'll call the whole bigger ones, you know, say two prime and one prime. Then the area of one plus the area of two, the total two. Divided by the area of the original triangle is basically going to just be the same as the area of one prime plus the area of two prime over the area. Oh, and that should I should have done this all in orange or blue because we've just increased everything by a factor of r, so the relative ratio doesn't change. So if I look at what was best in the blue triangle, if I swing it inward, that has to be what's best for the 45, 45, 90. I'm sorry? It's okay. This may not be the best way to do the problem. I am deliberately not cheating in this class. Um, I did check the algebra at home so that I, I don't mind having you know, a little bit of algebra confusion. Uh, it's good to see that. It's good to have tests to see, have you made an algebra mistake? You know, the fact that we were saying it was independent of X. Well, I can just check a few different values of X and clearly see it's not independent. So something must be wrong. But here, uh, this is really nice. It now shows that we don't really care what the um, maximum is. So we don't care what the angle is. We don't care how long the base is. I can always compress that and make it into an isosceles right triangle. And it's not going to change the relative ratios of the area of the two boxes to the area of the triangle. So do we agree with this lemma? All right, well, if this lemma is true, uh, did not give myself enough space, unfortunately. Uh, Okay, so now if this is true, if I give you some generic triangle like this, I claim I should be able to optimize each side independently. Does that make sense? Let's make it more pronounced. So if I have something like this, I can look and see what is the optimal. And let's say the optimal was something like this. I can then look at how much am I covering on the left half, how much am I covering on the right half. I can just view it as two different problems. And for the right half, without loss of generality, what can I assume about how long, you know, we'll assume it has height one. What can I assume about this length without loss of generality? What can I assume? Sure. 
Well, what did we just prove? You know, the, the limit we just proved a moment ago was that if I rescale and shift things out, then the ratio doesn't change. You know, if I look at how much it extends. So if there was something that was better than what you would get from the uh, isosceles right triangle, I could then just collapse that to something that's better for the isosceles right triangle. So it has to be at a third and two thirds, right? Because I can always adjust, you know, look at, you know, right half can rescale to isosceles right. So it's one third, two thirds for the rectangles. But what about the left? Do the left the same way. Same for the left. So as long as I have a triangle of some form like this, I'm okay. What's the danger? What's the triangle we have to be careful about? Outside. Yes, and this is and this is why I want to spend so much time on this problem because it's so easy to think we've solved the problem because when they draw a picture, you start to use the picture for your proof. And you, know, it looked like I was doing a decent job teaching you, right? I was covering lots of different cases. I was proving lemmas. Okay, I made some algebra mistakes. That's not necessarily great, but overall, I think I'm doing okay. But I'm still doing all of my argument based on that picture. And that picture might be forcing me to look in a certain way. What if the point is over here and my triangle looks like this? And now I have to figure out, you know, where do I want to do maybe maybe something like that. So is that something we need to worry about? Because if we, you know, if we look at the way the problem is drawn, let T be a triangle and let RNS be rectangles inscribed in T as shown. Well, there's lots of ways you can choose how to inscribe them. When we're doing it like this, are the three vertices equivalent? Does it matter? So, does it matter which way I orient things? So, for this one, they're, they're not letting me draw the triangles, I think, maybe like this. You know, that could be a possibility. They're, they're, they're having, the way they're drawing it here is one of the triangles is clearly coming up from the bottom of one of the sides. So I couldn't quite draw it like that, but maybe I could draw, you know, like this. something like that, perhaps. And so do we have to allow for all things like that? And so if I'm trying to you know do something over here, you know, do I have to consider that I could have a configuration like this? It doesn't seem to break any of the rules. Um, 
I'm coming up off of you know one of the bases. And so you know, looking at the picture, you know, I'm supposed to be coming up off a of base. I go up, and it looks like I go up until I hit maybe both sides, but maybe. All right, so do I always be able to come up and hit both sides? Well, if I have a triangle like this, I'm not going to be able to come up and hit you know two sides because I'm starting off from one of the other sides. I need the side to be coming in. So thoughts about how we could handle a case like this. So we could try to modify our argument and do it all over again for something like this. We could. And if you want to gather data, what would you choose maybe for this angle? Two natural choices. Okay, so 120 um, for, for, for down here. Yeah. Uh, if you do that as 120, then you can't have it. You can't have it of two single next rows. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, the, the big one, 120. So this would be 60. Yeah. Yes, 60 is one of the possibilities. 30 is a possibility. 45 is a possibility. You could try all of those. The other thing we could potentially do, oops, is what if we just added. An extra triangle like this. Now it's similar to the one we saw initially. The problem is now we would have to extend this inward and extend this inward. So let's think if we do this. Um, Is the stuff down here equal to the stuff up here? Or proportionally? Because we know how to do you know, the best thing possible with this big triangle. We would love to say that um, what we have included allows us to like reduce to the previous case. And so you know, one of the problems is we're adding stuff in some of these areas. And so we could try to do, you know, what's the calculation? So we know on this whole triangle, the best is going down a third and then two thirds. And we know if we look at just the triangle with the two blue sides, you know, we know what you know, goes on there. The question is, does that reduce to the problem that we're looking at initially? Because when we're extending, we're adding some rectangles that were not in the original triangle. So what are your thoughts? In general, do you think those areas are going to be equal? The, the two yellows and the two golds? So does it depend on the angle or is it that we have a rectangle here and we're just cutting the rectangle in half so those are gonna be the same? Right, but, but when, I'm, when I'm looking at just this, is the, is the gold in there the same as the yellow in there? 
if that's a rectangle, the answer would have to be yes. Yeah. And same for the other one. So those would be equal. I'm sorry? That's a yellow. Oh, I, I thought you said the gold and the brown. Uh, th this is supposed to be yellow. I know. We'll say mustard yellow. But I mean, be because these are rectangles and we have a diagonal, the, the, the gold and the yellow have to be the same. So we know that. So whatever that amount is, it's the same. The question is, can we somehow use the fact that we know how to optimize things um, for the big triangle? And this is where you might want to put in your names, maybe, you know, A, B, C, D. We know, so we can do triangle A, C, D. We want to somehow get triangle A, B, D from that. So one thing which we didn't compute before was we, we saw that the best was the isosceles right triangle where we go down a third and a third. What did that give us for the answer? Right? We never actually computed that. So A of one third, one third, is going to be uh, x, oh, I'm sorry, y was two thirds. Um, so it's going to be one third, and then y minus x is one third, plus one third, and then um, one minus x, uh, so one minus y, y is, uh, sorry, y is two thirds. So this should be two thirds times one third. For the year, is that correct? I'm using this formula. So we get one third times one third plus two thirds times one third. So that should be three ninths or one third. So the area is one third. So then the question is when we go over here, um, can we somehow use this to solve the problem. Uh, do we know, we know that, let's, let's give them names. If we call this, you know, one and two, we know the area of one plus the area of two is equal to two thirds I'm oh, sorry, no, it was one third, right? One third, the area of triangle BCD. And then if, it, if it's optimal, then we could figure out, of course, what's going on when we add on the reds. But the question is, is it possible to have something that's better for the reds than this? Or is this just fundamentally not a good approach that this approach works really well if the point D is somewhere between, you know, it's X coordinate is somewhere between A and B. Right. So we would need to figure out how much are those areas.
Now, I think we could modify our approach and you know, handle this case by doing you know, similar algebra. This could also be an indication that this is not the best way to pursue this problem. You know, it handles many cases. There's a lot of really nice features in this approach. And again, I don't particularly care about solving this problem. I care about talking about ways to attack problems like this. You know, reduce, you know, gathering data in the beginning, starting with an isosceles right triangle, and then saying that actually we can do the left and the right hand sides independently. We can expand, we can collapse. So as long as you know the point D is somewhere between A and B, then we can make this argument. The difficulty is what if it's outside? Is what do we do now in you know, a case like that? And so you know, to some extent, you almost want to use some kind of like linear algebra result to say that the relative ratios of areas won't change if I do some kind of coordinate transformation and then map it so that things are, but um, you know, it, it's no longer hitting the walls. So we could definitely write down equations and do a similar analysis. The real question is whether or not we can make any kind of simplifying assumption on um, the length maybe a, b. You know, could we play a game similar as before? And could we say that without loss of generality, if we try to stretch things, it wouldn't change. And then without loss of generality, we can assume that AB is just one. You know, could we do something like that? Can we do something with the angle? You know, as we swing, you know, is it possible, could we swing B inward to C? Could we shorten, the, you know, BC, make it steeper and steeper and steeper and reduce to the case of 90 degrees? Well, this is why they actually said maybe the limit doesn't exist. You know, as we get you know, triangles that are more and more obtuse, is it possible that there is no, you know, what if I give you something that is you know, like this, and then you know, we go you know, a huge amount. So maybe this is one unit, and this is you know, 10 to the thousand over here. And then we, you know, come up, oops, da, 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 you know, come up like that, and then we start trying to make the, well, so we'll have something like this, and then the question is, you know, how far can we go, and how much would we get? Or would we still be able to get a decent sized amount? So we were able to get one third before. Do we still expect to be able to get one third? And so some of it depends on what are the areas maybe of the yellow and the gold. I think this is enough for you to think about the problem. And then we'll finish this problem on Friday. But the goal is to just really explore how to look at stuff like this and how easy it is to come up with an assumption. So did you think we had solved the problem when we you know, did this argument here? and showed that we can always rescale to make it isosceles right, we can do the left and the right hand sides independently. You know, it's, it seemed like we had solved it. But implicitly in how it was written, you know, it's making us think that you know, we have the top vertex up like this. If that top vertex moves you know, to over here, and now the triangle looks like this, the drawing, but you know, 
And now we have to change things. So now it's going to look like this for R, maybe you know, this for S. You know, if we now do something like that, is it possible that we can now get some more than a third or less than a third? If it's, we, we were trying to maximize, right? So if we can show that that's not going to be a third, if it's going to be less than a third, that's fine. So if we can find a counterexample. So that's your question is, can you now come up with extreme triangles, maybe extreme obtuse triangles where you can get more than a third? But now you at least have an idea of what to be looking for. And, it, and if you can get more than a third, you know, how close can you get to the area of like one half? Well, without loss of generality, if we make the base one, you know, can I maybe make some kind of argument that I can say maybe without loss? Of, I don't know if I can say without loss of generality. I probably can't that the height is also one. I was thinking, you know, if I just compressed things and kept the shape. Because I, because I, I think that should be legal. Because I'm basically just changing the units in one direction. So, I, so I, I think you can say without loss of generality, the height is one, the base is one, but then you have some freedom in terms of the angle in which you put it. And so, can you get arbitrarily close to a half? Um, and then you know, find the maximum value or show that no maximum exists. So. If you can get a sequence of triangles, of, of sorry, of rectangles within it converging to a half, if it's never a half, um, then no maximum actually exists. Because it would be in like the limiting case of a triangle. I don't think you're going to get up to one half because that would be covering the entire area. But anyways, to just quickly recap, um, pictures are great. But whenever they draw something, it can force you to look at things in a certain way. It's almost like a magician that by doing something, they get your attention in a certain way. And you have to ask yourself, have I implicitly assumed anything in drawing it this way? Am I assuming that I have a certain geometric configuration? And the answer is often yes. I guess that it would seem to be like geometric, like why should you be drawing Yes. You ex exactly. Right, and the picture can have some additional things. It could be a special case. Yeah. And so, you know, this was a lot to do. In this was a lot of time to devote to one problem. And you know, we still haven't finished it. But I think there's a lot of good lessons here. And that's the main thing I want you to walk away from today is that it is so easy to force you to look at things. So I'm going to stop recording.